I'm not sure our speaker really needs an introduction because I think everybody knows Vincent Anderson. Um, he's a past president of the Historical Society, he's a current member, he's the research librarian here at the, the Donald W. Reynolds Library, and I'm so proud that he just recently completed his master's degree in early American history, 1800s. So how appropriate that he come speak. So he's going to talk about um, his master's thesis. I'll hook up to a microphone. Where was that microphone at? Actually? Right here. Oh, there it is. <laughs> Let me know if you want the lights to change. If we could drop them down just just a hair, that would be good. You found that jacket when you got your master's degree? Yes. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you, look official. Congratulations. Thank you. I'll do the telephone commercial. Can you hear me now? Yep. Good deal. That's great. All right. Um, so I have uh, I have worked on this uh, master's degree and the graduate degree for two and a half years. And so I finished, and uh, I was supposed to find out, it was kind of funny, I was supposed to find out if I passed or failed. They told me, like, in mid-December, we'll tell you the 27th of December. <laughs> so you can enjoy your Christmas holiday. <laughs> Merry Christmas. So we were actually opening up gifts with my family on, on a... And I got a phone call, and it was the day before the 27th, because they said, we'll let you know before the 27th, because you'll have to re-up and register to get another class in to do another different thesis if you fail. And so all of a sudden, I'm looking at my phone, and I see it's the university. It's a day early, and I'm thinking, ah! Oh. <laughs> I gotta do another And so my advisor called me up and let me know that uh, I grad. She says, I just thought... You know, I don't want to interrupt your holiday. She says, we knew the 21st of December you already graduated. We just didn't contact you because we want you to enjoy your holiday. I'm like, interrupt me, please, interrupt me. That's all right. So, but anyway, we got through it. And uh, so I am really tickled. I, I have learned a, a lot uh, on a certain gentleman. And I was joking here a while back with somebody. I have, uh, I have literally turned into a stalker and so I have literally stalked a gentleman for about the period of 10 years. Uh, about 10 years ago I was in Little Rock, Arkansas and uh, while I was down there I gravitate towards cemeteries and so I just like cemeteries. Your mic went off. Our mic is off? It just went back on. Maybe put it a little higher on your shirt there. See if that works. Or on your... How about, how about that? No? How about this? I'll try to, I'll try to stand near here. Okay. I'll try to stand here. And so um, I was down in Little Rock, Arkansas, and while I was down there, I stopped by a... I got feedback? <laughs> okay. So while I was down there, so there was this very historic cemetery. It's called uh, Mount Holly Cemetery, and it's where if you are anyone and you die, you get to be buried there. And it's it's a very prestigious cemetery. It's if you're a governor, uh, territorial governor, Arkansas governor, state senator, U.S. senator, you get buried there. They, they do uh, movies. They have the beautiful mausoleums and statue, statuaries. It's just beautiful. And so I'm down there, and there's another gentleman that's down there also. And he's a historian. And, and we're walking along, and we're looking at Governor Conway, and we're just going all the way down, all these governors. There's this Indian chief, the Cherokee Indian chief, that his wife died in 1836. She's buried there. And all of a sudden, you go to this gentleman's grave site here, and you, I'm looking at it, and I'm going, a captain, U.S. Corps of Engineers, a Yankee captain from upstate New York. What is a Yankee captain doing 
in an Arkansas historic cemetery with Confederate flags stuck around everywhere else. <laughs> and uh, he said, I don't know. He says, it's kind of a mystery. He says, you ought to write an article someday on that. I'm like, okay. And the next time I was down at Little Rock, I drove in there. I parked my car in there, walked up through the carriage lanes. I mean, the lanes are still tiny for carriages. And I'm going there, and I'm just looking at it, and I'm reading the tombstone. And there is just something about that tombstone and this monument that stands 14 feet high. Um, it's just, there's just something about it. Just I kept being drawn to it. And so I, I would start looking him up. There wasn't a whole lot of information about him. Uh, I have basically found on secondary resources from the Corps of Engineer, their books and stuff, I found about five paragraphs. But I'm, why in the world is this Yankee <laughs> buried here? There's got to be something about, I mean, they, there's a reason for everything here. And so um, I just kind of kept that in the back of my mind. And then I started coming across different, different, I like maps. I love old maps, historic maps. And so I'm going through maps in the archives down at Little Rock. And there is a map with his name on it. And I'm looking at the map. I'm like, wait a minute, I've seen that name before, and I've realized he is referenced in a book called uh, Steamboats and Ferries of the White River. I'm like, ah, oh, okay, that's why that name seems familiar. And things just started clicking after that. And then I started collecting Corps of Engineers official reports. So every commander every year fills out a report about all their rivers. And uh, here's each book. So each year may have two volumes, each year may have six volumes, and each volume is 800 to 900 pages. And so every time I'm down a little rock, I start photocopying everything that has his name in there. Here's 1871, 1872, I mean anything about the whole area that he, he even touched. And I just started collecting things. And also I started requesting his name at different places, and I started acquiring his letters. Then I started looking for newspaper articles and appeals to this man. And so I started tracking him down and pulling all these sources together. And when I was in uh, grad school, my, I had a professor said, you need something very unique that no one has really written about, but you've got to have a lot of primary resources. And I thought, I got it. I got this one. And so I proposed something with this gentleman on the White River. And I laid out a ton of information, and my professor just shot me down. She's going, no, nope, that's, that's something else. She, said, you, you, she says, you're going way off on another tangent. She says, this, that could be a dissertation. She said, uh, this is a thesis. You need to do the gentleman. And my heart sank because I had, this all, I had prepared for two and a half years just to wham and hit him with it, you know, and so it didn't work out. But she shot me down, and three days later, it just settled on me. I'm, this, this woman's right. And so I wrote about this gentleman and his impact on Arkansas. And we are unique and different and changed because this guy came to Arkansas in 1884. This man made a difference. Um, he had enemies. And because of his enemies, I believe some of those enemies kind of shot him down for a while. And that's why we do not know that much about Captain Tabor. So I'm going to dive into Captain Tabor here. Uh, so what do I do? Just hit that there? Arrow keys. Oh, okay. When, um, when you're writing history, uh, there, is, there is a quote I came across here well, a long time ago, actually. His name is Douglas Southall Friedman. Um, he made this quote. He was, he was, he was huge on writing uh, biographies and history on Lincoln. Generally, this man knew generally inside and out. And uh, he could actually take some of General Lee's stuff and just interpret it like, it just spoke volumes. And, and this is his quote. You know when you're at the part where you can actually write something, and he was talking about, they were asking him, how do you know you can write history? He says, you know when you're actually at the part you can write something is when you hear the people talk. And they're like, well, how can you hear the people talk? He says, you soak your mind in primary sources. So you're going to official reports, you're going to letters and everything else, and you're seeing what they say. And after a while, all of a sudden, you wake up in the middle of the night, and you literally hear them. You hear their voice, and they're talking to you. And uh, if you ever have a writer's block, 
you go back and soak your brain in more of that stuff and come and get their perspective, see where they lived at, uh, go up and down the places they walked, uh, sit on the riverbanks, see what happened on that riverbank, see how it's changed over the years from different maps and different pictures. And all of a sudden you will hear their voice in your head. And so that's how I, uh, I did my thesis. And uh, at first I was a little daunted that, you know, they said you have to do at least 20,000 words, you know, we're looking for at least 120 pages, no less, you know, just no more, just 120 pages. And I'm like, my goodness. So I just sat down and started writing and then I couldn't believe how much actually was coming out. And as I was writing it, I thought I had all my stuff together and every, every couple days something else would just pop up and I'm like, oh my goodness. I was just having a happy time with myself. And so, uh, this is my this is my gentleman here. This is Captain Henry Sheldon Tabor. Um, right after the Civil War in 1869, he was 18 years old. He lived up near Albany, New York, and um, he applied to go to West Point. And he went through an examination, and when they examined all the cadets, he was number three. <coughs> He went through school and graduated number three. He knew engineering so well and river hydraulics, and he adapted so well to it, that the day he graduated, they kept him at West Point, and he became a professor like that. Smart guy, very smart young man. So 1873, he went from being a student one morning, and the next afternoon, he was commissioned as a first lieutenant in the U.S. Army Corps of Engineers, and uh, he was a professor, and he taught engineering. And he stayed there for nine years, and he taught nine years. Um, all of a sudden, out in the Dakotas, they needed someone to help work on the rivers out there and the river mechanics, and uh, also lay down sewer pipe for some towns, surveying, uh, build roads. Uh, he was in charge of building five bridges. He did it in two years. He was in charge of building a military road across the Dakotas for 187 miles. And uh, he was, he knew his business and he had a lot of authority, but uh, the gentleman had a very quiet and meek spirit about himself also. He was not very, he was not haughty. Um, I'll just go ahead, I'm going to cut to the chase on one thing. On his tombstone, it said that he strapped on the armor of God at the age of nine years, and he never left his Lord. Wow. The young man became a Christian at age nine. When he left New York, um, he was already a part of the YMCA, Young Men's Christian Association. The YMCA, you know, YMCA. You know, <laughs> I mean, and so you're going to have to get a different concept of YMCA. They were truly Christian. They were evangelistic. They were, they were preachers. Um, that wherever he went, he and his wife, he got married while he was being a professor. Her name was, was uh, Elizabeth uh, Burdick and uh, went by the name of Libby. They, everywhere they went, they believed that they were missionaries. If they were in New York, they were missionaries. They went to Dakota Territory. Um, there, were, there were two newspaper articles that were referencing him that he had no qualms in associating with whatever race. He wasn't prejudiced a bit. And I found out how open he was at the latter part, two days before my thesis was finalized, I hit something, I'm like, woo, I'll tell you later. Um, so, uh, so all of a sudden, in 1884, he got a call that he was to be recruited and sent to Little Rock, Arkansas, and he was going to be over the Little Rock District. This is about what the district looks like. This is the Little Rock District in 1884. So um, this is 1881 all the way to 1884. 1886, they started shrinking the district down because he actually controlled some of the rivers. 
So you have the Osage River all the way up in Missouri that was part up there. That was his district. All the way down uh, to South Arkansas, to the Red River. He had the Arkansas River, the Black River, the Cash River, the Washita River, the Little Missouri River, the Little Red River, um, the Black River. The man was, he was everywhere, man. I mean, he was. He did, he did everything. And so... The problem that they actually had was down in Pine Bluff, Arkansas. Pine Bluff had had problems with the Arkansas River, um, and you can go back to the newspaper reports all the way back to 1869. Um, Arkansas had a lot of floods, 1858, 1862, 1864, 1867. We would go from flood to complete drought, and the banks would just literally dry out, and the next year we'd have floods, and the banks would just shear off. Pine Bluff was falling into the Arkansas River. The Corps of Engineers up in, up in Washington, D.C. came up with a plan. We are going to cut Pine Bluff, Arkansas off and cut across, cut the river three and a half miles off of this oxbow and just leave Pine Bluff high and dry and then we'll just take the river away from Pine Bluff because uh, storefronts and houses were literally falling into the river. And uh, they estimated just to fix it for that year to, uh, you know, put some brush and stuff in and around Pine Bluff is going to cost $60,000. They called him up. He went there in uh, June of June 1884, June 3rd. He arrived in Pine Bluff two weeks later. He looked at it and uh, he said that he had a plan. The Corps of Engineers said, well, what's your plan? He said, well, it's not regulation. They said, well, it has to be regulation. He said... I, can, I have an idea that I have been inspired from above how to fix this, but it's not regulation. I want you to trust me. What I am looking for, and he told, the command, he told his commander in Washington by telegraph, what I am looking for is a lion-hearted man to follow my orders and not regulation. And... Uh, the people of Pine Bluff were writing letters, telegraphing, and everything else. We're losing it here. Let him do what he wants to do. And so um, eventually, about two weeks after that, they said, do what you need to do. He went down to Pine Bluff, and he started using uh, different, I'll, I'll show you a couple of drawings here in a minute. Uh, he started using, instead of, they had to mine rocks, put rocks in a certain size box put the box at a certain depth, at a certain width, and then lay the brush front ways to the river. And he did everything opposite, and he was using sandboxes. And they're like, it will not work. Well, they eventually let him do it. And so they said it was gonna be $60,000 and all this other stuff, stuff. He came in under budget. He cut it. He saved 45% off the budget. Wow. And he saved Pine Bluff, Arkansas. By September, Pine Bluff was doing well. They were every, the river was working against itself. Uh, people in Little Rock saw what was happening. They were having a problem too, and he had just moved to Little Rock. Um, so the mayor of Little Rock got a hold of him and says, if you can fix Pine Bluff, you can fix Little Rock. He started fixing Little Rock, Dardanelle, Arkansas on the Arkansas River came down and they had a delegation and so did Fort Smith, they had a delegation. So he was working all up and down the Arkansas River. In December of 1884, he was only there almost six months, the delegation from the White River, Upper White River, from Marion County, Izzard County, Independence County, there were nine counties all the way up into Missouri. Taney County and Ozark County, there were nine counties. They formed a delegation. They went to his house in Little Rock and said, you are our man and you can fix the White River. And he started surveying the White River and took him three years. And he did a survey all the way from Forsyth, Missouri, all the way down to the mouth of the Mississippi. That's 505 miles. They surveyed both sides of the river. They documented who lives on that river, the declinations, the, the height, the bluffs. Uh, they, they documented every, every road for 505 miles on both sides, every road is documented. Every ferry, every steamboat landing, every sunken steamboat, every cave, it's all there. And it's still there, and it shows it. It shows what's under Bull Shows Lake in 1885. And so uh, that's what he did. And so the man just 
brought everything together and uh, he literally is the one that came up with the concept of using dams to control the White River and he was the first one to mention of putting a dam on the White River to actually create a lake. They thought it was a joke. But they never followed his plan of doing that. But even after his death, 20 years later, they were still following his plans. And so there, there would be commanders saying, this is what we should do. And you, they're giving it word for word. And you go back to his reports, and they're, they're quoting him. And so uh, I'm going to show you some of the stuff I started going through. Ah, in the official reports, there is something about, that's a little cloudy. I know it's a little is. But in the official reports, they document every map that was ever created of any river in Arkansas, Missouri, Oklahoma, Tennessee. They tell you what year it was created, how much of the map, who did the map, and everything else. And from there, you go to your primary resources and you start pulling maps. We start traveling places to pull the maps and finding these maps. And then you can go to an archive and go, I'm looking for this map. And they're going, I don't know if we even have that. And a lot of these maps are these old books from the 1860s, 70s, and 80s that are folded up, that are literally a yard by yard. I mean, three feet by three feet, and they are all folded up into a book. And you have to open them up real carefully and lay them out and scan them really carefully and start piecing them together. And so this is some of my how I was actually going through finding the characteristics of different things. I was working on the White River. Uh, some on the Arkansas River, St. Francis River. Does anyone know much about the St. Francis River? It's eastern Arkansas. St. Francis River was a great river to be on before the uh, earthquake of the New Madrid Fault. And after the New Madrid Fault, everything just kind of fell in on itself. And they called it the Sump Lands. And because all the timber fell in, started growing on top of each other, and created this called the, the uh, St. Francis Raft. You could just walk up and down the river on some places and not even get wet because of all the trees that had fallen in on itself and all the shrubs built up. And so uh, they surveyed it and cleaned it out, and he was the first one to do it. And so he tackled the sunk lands. Um, the one problem that we had up down all these rivers now, the Arkansas district had 14 rivers. Here's, here is a little here is a thing that uh, that was sent. It was a newspaper article that was sent to Captain um, Tabor, and it was clipped out. And I found the article, and I found out it was clipped out from 1866. People kept sending all these newspaper clips to the Corps of Engineers, saying we have a problem on the river, and they were sending this to Washington D.C. So uh, this is the Cape Bruner on the White River. It sank with a press type and um, flatware or something like that. Fixtures. 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 Mm -hmm. I'm having a hard time reading over here. With the establishment of a newspaper office in Searcy, White County, lost the whole of its material by the sinking of that boat. So these, these uh, steamboats would literally sink in the river and they lost, I mean, they, they would lose it. Um, so there was, there was a big problem. They had all these snags on the river, and so you'd have all these big trees and the trunks sticking up, and a steamboat would come over and snag and just sink it, and just start, and you, you'd lose your content, and people would be jumping out of steamboats, swimming to the river, river bank. Some people never made it out. Uh, also, you had the river banks, so you have the snags in the river, you have the trees on the side of the river, and the trees start going like this, and they start branching out, and steamboats were going up and down the White River, there was a steamboat in 1848 that left Buffalo Shoals and it was headed to Forsyth, Missouri. Think about that. And they were two miles from Forsyth and they were all excited. And they hit a grove of trees, overhanging trees over the White River, and they lost two steam stacks. And people got, and, and an engineer got burnt and everything else. And so, I mean, it's pretty hazardous. So they would actually hire guys to hang off the sides of steamboats with saws. And they would saw off lanes up and down. And it got so hazardous, Captain Tabor actually submitted a plan to pay these guys hazardous duty pay. And uh, 
they said, no, 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 they don't get hazardous duty pay. For two years, they had a prob they, they, they always had a problem of guys hanging. No one really wanted to do that for a while. And they would only do it for six months. So Captain Tabor pushed it and got hazardous duty pay. There were guys working up to 10 months on the river, willing to hang off a boat or whatever it took to start cutting the trees and everything else to make a path to going up and down the river. And so uh, hazardous duty pay. This is some of the drawings that Captain Tabor submitted that was that were going on. Uh, there was a mattress boat, and so you build up all these mattresses and you lay up on the and these mattresses you lay down and you sink into the river or you lay them up on the side of the river. It's called revetments, and so it protects the river bank, or you're building up one part of the river so you can actually create a deep current in the other part of the river, and so you're building up a bank here, and so you're building mattresses. And uh, these mattresses, um, they had mattress boats, but some of these mattresses were up to, and they were taking big branches of willow branches, hickory branches, and they would literally weave them together. And I've got some pictures here in a moment to show you. They would weave them together, and some of those mattresses would be up to a quarter to a half mile long. Once they would weave these all together, they'd have mules up on the bank, and these mules would start dragging these mattresses up on the bank and, and adjusting them. And so, um, that's how they would do it. And then once they got the mattresses up there, they had other laborers with wheelbarrows and rocks in the wheelbarrows, and they'd run the wheelbarrows up on different places and, and hold the mattresses down. So uh, here's some of the boats that he used. So in my adventures of finding Captain Tabor, he got there in 1884. He needed a place to live, and so he rented a little place in Little Rock but the best place to live was on Louisiana Street. And so I was going through the archives and found out also in the ancestry that his address for his census. So I'm looking up 1624 Louisiana Street. There it is on the census. I'm like, I know where that area is. And so a couple months ago, I dropped my wife and daughter off at a, at a mall. And I decided to go there because I didn't want them to go in that part of town. <laughs> and so uh, I headed off to his house. This house was built in 1885 by Captain Tabor. In the backyard is a little shed. And I asked, I asked the owner, I said, do you happen to have a little office or a shed in the back with a table attached to a wall that comes out? He said, yeah, I do. So that, that was his office. That was his office at home before, and he also had an office downtown. But his backyard connected to the backyard of the governor of Arkansas. So guess who they visited across the fenceway with the governor? Now the governor's home today is about a quarter mile up the hill, and every night if you're around the governor's place, police cars are at the intersection of every corner around the governor's home mansion because it's not the best place yet and so they're they're reviving it it looks better than it did let me tell you it looks a lot better than it did 15 years ago and uh, so this was built in 1885 I wanted to visit this house because in this house a particular thing happened in the parlor uh, since he was part of the YMCA he and his wife were missionaries they brought in orphan kids every Sunday to their home in their parlor and they gave them Bible studies and Sunday school to the orphans and to children who did not have a chance to go to church and they taught them taught them to read and write scriptures and so um, that's one reason I want to go there and so here I am it's getting dark I found the place I'm knocking on this guy's door. He doesn't trust me, and I'm wondering who I'm knocking on. So uh, we made, I, I talked really fast, as you know I can talk. Made friends really quick, and uh, told him what I'm doing there. And uh, told him I'm going to send him a copy of my thesis once I get it all fixed and published together. And so he will get a copy of my thesis. And so very nice guy. He didn't really know a whole lot about the place. He, knew, he bought it. Bought the house that had the sign out there, didn't know a whole lot what was going on with it. He just knew it was the Tabor Patterson house. So, right there is a, a city directory of, of uh, Little Rock. And you can see 
Henry Tabor S. Captain U.S. Engineers Chief, U.S. US Office uh, West 17th, which is part of Louisiana, Treasurer of YMCA. Treasurer of YMCA. So when he came to Little Rock, he became the treasurer of the YMCA. After he was the treasurer of the YMCA, two years later, he started representing as a treasurer and a trainer for the South. So we have this guy from New York coming in. He is one of the most popular men in all of Arkansas. Newspapers have glowing reviews about Captain Tabor. He's going up and down the river and he's helping reestablish steamboat landings. There was this one article, <laughs> had a steamboat landing, he dedicated it, he basically led a little revival service out there. Wherever he was going, he was doing things like that. Um, so he's really big in the YMCA. This plays very big at the end of his life. So he arrives at Little Rock at age 34. He stays in Little Rock for 10 years. This is not normal. If you are a commander of the Corps of Engineers, you usually stay two to three years in one place. They do not want you to become so attached that people depend on you and they, they come to you for representation. Captain Tabor broke the mold. He was so good, they let him stay for 10 years. He burned out after a while, but he, he was just, he was that good. And so uh, he took charge of also mapping the Arkansas River. They literally mapped from Wichita, Kansas, all the way down to the Mississippi River. And uh, this, is, this is the uh, page here. This one is from Fort Gibson to Little Rock, 82 sheets. And you open that thing up, and it is beautiful. It shows so much detail. So much detail. This is 1887. Uh, this one right here, this is 22 sheets. This is from Little Rock to the mouth of the Arkansas River. And there we have Captain Tabor's name there again. Um, the engineers, like Charles E. Taft, he pulled out the biggest names in engineering all over the United States and brought them down to help survey. There was this one guy he brought in from Memphis, Tennessee. His last name was Livermore. The man did every, I mean, the guy was like a legend in Pennsylvania on engineering and building canals, and he pulled him down here. The man, he, he did the White River. He was 72 years old. He, had a, he ended up with an eye disease by the time he got to Buffalo City, and then he still kept, he encouraged him to keep working all the way down. By the time he got to Batesville, he couldn't do any more. They had somebody else to replace him. And then Captain Tabor went out and used core money to buy medicine for him. Captain Tabor used core money to buy medicine for about all of his men. And there are reports like, why are you buying medicine for him? But he was buying medicine for his men, especially when they were working in East Arkansas. From, I mean, he was, he was very concerned about malaria and mosquito bites, and they were complaining about how many mosquitoes there were in the sunk lands, and uh, how that you even had a hard time breathing, and they were using handkerchiefs and cloths over their mouth, and then they would dip the cloth in water, but then they were afraid to dip the cloth in water because it might have malaria in it. It's just all this stuff, and so he was buying quinine, and you name it, he was, he was buying it. And so they, they complained about it in Washington, but uh, I never, they, they complained every year about it, but he never said one thing about it. He just kept, kept going on. Um, so in 1884, finished, he is a, he's a hero. They decide, the Corps of Engineers decide to build a steamboat or a snag boat to work the White River. They named the snag boat the Henry Sheldon. Two years later, they decided to build another snag boat. They called it the Henry Breck. Guess what his son's name was? Henry Breck Sheldon. And so that happened. By that time that happened, I am looking for the Libby Tabor going up and down the Arkansas summer. <laughs> I never found a, I mean, I have the book. I've got a big book here on all the different steamboats. And this is a really good, this one, 
we have this at the library. This is called Waze Packets Directory, 1884 to 1994. It's every steamboat in the United States. What happened, when it was built, what kind of ship it was, what happened to it, how it was destroyed, everything else. So that's, that is a really good source right there. I want to show you another source here. This one is called Lloyd Steamboat Directory and Disasters on the Western Waters. This is, Arkansas is the West. Arkansas, Missouri is the Wild West. This was printed in 18, um, 1817. And so they had a lot of, I mean, the first few years of steamboats, they had a lot of disasters. And so uh, other sources here. Western, this is called the Western Gazetteer. Gazette and see, Immigrants Directory containing geographical description of the western states and territories. And it has a lot of steamboats and all the problems that they were encountering there. So, here are some of Captain Tabor's drawings. And uh, this is the first, these are the drawings that he, um, he had these published in 1888. But he submitted these drawings, these are the first drawings he submitted in 1884 how to fix the, the uh, Arkansas River at Pine Bluff. And this is what he was scoffed at. And uh, a few years later, he was, he was feeling pretty good. And uh, he said, if you ever have a problem, go look at Pine Bluff. <coughs> Listen to the citizens. And by 1888, he was packing a punch. I mean, he was fighting back. The reason he was fighting back is because he had he started receiving a lot of opposition from a certain well he was having a lot of opposition from the railroads. He was literally hurting the railroad industry in Arkansas. And so here's some of the things that he was drawing. Here's Pine Bluff, Arkansas. And you can see the maps that he was taking care of and documenting. I'm going to skip on through here really quick and get to some other things. Here is St. This is one of the maps that he was over and he went down to survey. This is St. Charles, Arkansas. Does anyone know about the Battle of St. Charles in the Civil War? It was the worst battle, river battle, in the Civil War. It was the worst one. Um, the Union came up and had these ships and the Confederates were ready and somebody fired a shot just right with, with a uh, howitzer cannon and hit a steamboat and it blew up and it scalded and killed a hundred men, Union men, and the men were jumping out screaming and everything else, um, burnt, and the Confederates were around the river. The Confederates were literally getting, honestly, they, they were not in good shape. They were getting beat up. This is their one glory wave here of hurting the Union. And so they lost a hundred men. They were shooting men in the river. Um, even though it sounds really good that the Confederates might have really pulled that one off, when the day was over, the Union pretty much won it. And so, uh, but you can actually see here, they actually talk about the wrecks here. And he literally shows where the wrecks are in the river. This is in 1887 when this one was drawn. They actually show and how deep the river is. So you can actually see all these numbers here, 16, this is 10, this is 11, this is 9, 7, 6, 5, 6, and then you go across the river here, 7, 6, 8, 11, 10. And so they, they took sound depths, and they were taking sound depths every 39 feet. Uh, up here on the White River, they were taking sound depths about every 115 feet. And so, I, you know, you can take the map and you can put it over Google Maps, and I can go to that exact part of the river, and I know how deep the river was in 1884 and 85. So, so there's St. Charles. <clears throat> okay, here's the White River. Here's Oakland, Arkansas. This is, uh, right there's Oakland. This is all under the lake. This is Pine Mountain here. Here's Dry Run right here. There's the water through there. <coughs> These sheets are about this, this large or this large. I have a hand scanner. It takes me about 33 scans to do one high resolution map. And then I take the scans and I stitch them together. And so 
Uh, here is a map of the White River. Okay, here's Trimble Flat. Here's the Civil War Salt Peter Cave. Everyone says the cave is here, and this is the cave everyone visits. Mm -hmm. They have it here. So this is where a friend of mine, Kenny, and I went. I made friends with all the people through here. There's houses all up here. So I made friends with everybody so I could trespass. <laughs> and then we came right here and we slid down the mountain here off the bluff. It took us a little over an hour, about an hour and a half to get down there and about an hour and a half to get back up the other way because it was so bad the one way, I'm like, we're not going that way. We're coming back a different way. And so we scooted on our stomachs up the bluff. And uh, you do stupid things after, you, you don't realize it's stupid until you get on top of it and it's all <laughs> over with. So we actually made the deal, okay, if you get hurt or die or I get hurt or die, we, I'm not dragging you up the top of this mountain. There's guides down below on the White River. We'll just drag each other by the leg till we get to a guide down on the river. <laughs> so, good deal. That's how we did it. Were you on the Baxter County side? Is that, are they? Uh, this is Marion County side. And so this right here is called Du Ford. So right here, there's, there's houses here. Right here is the state park. This is where Gaston's Visitor Center is at. See that right there? There's Gaston's. So it has the river depth all the way through here. Um, here's a ferry here, Collins Ferry. This is Bruce Creek. Now this is blurry up here, but I'm telling you, when you look at the maps, they are very clear and crisp, and you can see everything here. So here's Bruce Creek, and there's if, and uh, if you go up, there's a dirt road right up here, and you take the dirt road up, you hit up up to Mucky Run, but uh, you can work your way on down here, and um, let's see what's next here. Oh yeah, so this is the airport strip here, and you're working way on down. Tommy, where do you live at? Right through here? No, further back up. Oh, um, above the above the airport. Above the airport. Yeah, right. So you're right through here? Right, right. You were saying going up Monkey Run, I'm about a mile from where you cut to go from Monkey Run. Oh, okay. Okay. Um, so it shows all it shows McBee landing here. And you blow this thing up, it shows you there's there's a grist mill, there's a cotton gin. Uh, it shows where the locations of those things are at. Uh, Kemp's place. This is Cotter. I want to show you one thing here. Do you see the Cotter Spring? There's no Cotter Spring there. It was filled with gravel and water by the reports. And if you look across here, there is a little thing right here and then on a big map it says Roaring Spring. So this is on Marion County side. Roaring Spring was a huge spring that was used by people in Flippin, Arkansas. It was their big watering hole, and they would go down. There is an old, old road that works its way down the mountain here to Roaring Spring. And so uh, I've got, I, I went over that, and I went over the reports. It does not show, so, you know, it just shows it's, it's very um, successful. There's a lot of gravel, pit, and water there, but it's not showing it's not showing the Cotter Spring. That's my one going, huh, that's odd. Because you think that spring, you know, whatever. But that's, that year could have been filled up with, because it was just full of, it was a huge gravel pit. It's the way they documented it. It's a huge gravel pit with springs around, but it doesn't show the spring. I thought that was odd. And so, uh, but then it shows all the different ferries through here. We're going to start zipping through here. Ah. Here they're making mattresses. So those are willow branches and hickory branches all weaving together. You see the strings up here, the ropes? They're getting ready to pull that up the, up the bank. And uh, they've got it pulled up there. Then they have guys out there with wheelbarrows and they're hauling, they got uh, flat boats and barges with uh, quarried rock. And then they start, start taking wheelbarrows pushing that rock. So, and they weren't prisoners either. 
Yeah. <laughs> How about that? Um, they document all up and down the route. I don't have time for that. We're just going to zip on through here. Ha! I want to show you this one. It shows Mount Home Steamboat landings. You see that? Landings, plural. And so, see this right here? See that little anchor? And there's an anchor here. There are two steamboat landings in the 1880s for Mountain Home. Here and here. That right there, Hindman Creek. Today we know it as Big Creek. Uh, it's right. It's right upstream from Norfolk. I will show you. And so this is what it looks like. Norfolk is right on down the way. And so you have here and here the steamboat landings. It'd be pretty interesting to walk down there in the winter time and metal detector. Just saying. And so right there they are. Um, Norfolk, Arkansas is the next map. See Matney Knob? And you got uh, you got the ferry here called Souths Ferry. S-O-U-T-H-S. -S, Souths. Hard to say with my southern draw sometimes. There it is. And work your way on down to Calico Rock. So right up there at the very top, you have Calico, you have the big bluff where everyone gets on top of and takes the pictures. And uh, there's Calico Rock. I'm going to get a really good close up of Calico Rock. The steamboat landing there. See the little anchor there by Calico? Shows a store. This is when they were actually building the railroad there at Calico Rock, all the way up through there. And there is that bluff. Wow. This is 1901. Now, I am not a big graphic designer, but I took that picture and I am working on colorizing it. So it's not perfect. And. I go off and I like to hang off of different things. And there's that right there. That's where they were at. See, just doing a thesis, I, I do other things just kind of just for the joy, to, you know. Just zip on through. And so uh, there's Calico. Last snag boat to work the White River was actually, there it is, that is the Henry Sheldon. Um, it was finally sold in 1924 to a private company and they used it as scrap by 1924 to service other steamboats. It lasted so long but the hull was starting to wear out and start, they, they put a new hull in it in uh, 1918 and um, just building a new hull for all that and just redoing everything is very expensive and so they started using the steam, uh, the engine, and everything else for others for scrap parts and so. Transportation rivalry. It actually ended up between the St. Louis Iron Mountain Southern Railroad and Captain Tabor. They <coughs> were the ones that were going against each other. The railroads literally hated the man for one reason. Captain Tabor was opening up the Arkansas River and the White River. That was his two goals. If he could open up those two rivers, people would start using the rivers for transportation and for shipping. Shipping rates dropped 52% between 1884 and 1892. They hated him. <laughs> people loved him because all of a sudden, here up and down the river, they were like, this is great. And so commodities up through here from Batesville all the way up, commodities were being cut literally being cut in half. Let's say you want to buy a bag of coffee or a bag of sugar or whatever. Um, it's going to cost you. All of a sudden your grocery bill is cut in half because this man is going up and down the river clearing the trees out, 
they're very expert. He was very good at throwing dynamite in the right spot, mm -hmm. and he was he was blowing a channel through Buffalo. The main, the worst part of all of for the Corps of Engineers was the White River was Buffalo City, and that whole what, there was about a mile through there that they worked and worked and worked and worked, and they threw a lot of dynamite in there. They blew up a lot of stuff just to get a steamboat up through there. If the steamboat was going to get stuck on the White River, it was Buffalo Shoals. And so people capitalized on that because they put a lot of hotels there. <laughs> and so that's why they had some big hotels there because steamboats got caught there and so they didn't want to stay on the steamboat all the time. It's going to take a week or so for the water to rise. Got a hotel there. And then people would stick the steamboat company with the bill. So, <clears throat> so you had the rivalry there. Um, I am going to... In 1891, they had a delegation that met, actually, at Batesville, Arkansas. They had delegates from nine Arkansas and two Missouri counties. They met at a convention in Batesville, uh, June 3rd, 1891. The meeting was called to order by the election of N.M. Dyer of Baxter County as a chairman and M.Y. Toddsman as secretary, who was the editor-in-chief of the Batesville Guard newspaper. So these guys were pretty big stuff. This, in 1891, was the first time all the communities had a rivalry going on, kind of. They were always competing against each other. They, another town could hurt another town on shipping or whatever, they would do it. This is the first time in 1891 that these communities in nine counties got together and said, wait a minute, we've got to be working together. And they met at Batesville, and they had two representatives from, uh, they had representatives from Ozark County and Taney County, okay, because you're going up uh, the Little North Fork all the way up into Thidosha area, and also up into Forsyth, which is Taney County, and then they had the other seven counties working down to Batesville. They met together, they had two U.S. Senators and two Congressmen there, and they had Captain Tabor there at the meeting. Big stuff. Um, the guy who did a huge speech, his name was Mr. W.R. Jones, and he was the editor for the Mountain Echo in Yellville, Arkansas, and he gave this huge speech, and it was published in three newspapers. I'm going to give you a couple little excerpts here. In my honest opinion, this is Mr. Jones from the Mountain Echo talking at Batesville, untold millions of dollars are hid in the hills of the upper White River. To say nothing of the timber and the productions of soil, little of this vast wealth will ever be developed until trans the transportation question is solved and the White River is the key to the situation. I do not believe that this wealth will ever be fully developed until we get railroads. Wait a minute. Captain Tabor has helped everyone drop the rates down here, but listen to this, to railroads. But I do not believe that it could be largely developed if we, ha if we have a regular transportation for the river. Trans river transportation is vital, and I believe it's the quickest way to give railroad transportation through river transportation. So basically, they asked Captain Tabor, we want you to go to Congress and request $1 million to open up the White River and to put in locks and dams up and down the river to get the steamboats up here. Once we can do that, you can start help hauling materials up and down the White River to help build railroads. So they asked him to work himself out of a job. He was stuck. He obliged. He said, I kindly oblige as your obedient servant.